So welcome everybody to our third uh, webinar for this year Intercity Project Workshop. Uh, we have had some very good and thoughtful presentations in the, in the past webinars, and I'm sure that today will be uh, really excellent also. Um, Intercity is a Brazilian project that combines nine different uh, universities in Brazil and also uh, government, a few governments and a startup. And we work together to develop science and technology around the idea of smart cities and the future internet. And uh, this year, we are taking the opportunity that we cannot have uh, in-person meetings to have these online webinars. And we are starting each of the four webinars with a um, keynote speech, a guest uh, lecture from partners that we have around the world. And we selected four very top thinkers, in my opinion, people that have um, very interesting work and work with significant impact in the field. And that we will have more impact in the field, we believe. And today, our guest, our star guest is Ricardo Alvarez. And Ricardo is an academic and researcher whose work focuses on exploring the boundaries of digital technologies used for urban design purposes. He has performed research and teaching work as part of the City Design and Development Group and as a member of the Sensible City Lab at MIT for the past nine years. Dr. Alvarez has participated in urban innovation research projects that use mixed media, IoT, and AI in cities as diverse as Dallas, Laval, Cambridge, Amsterdam, Melbourne, Shenzhen, Paris, Mandolin, Curitiba, and others, not Sao Paulo yet. While his work covers a wide range of topics from autonomous vehicles to urban innovation districts and smart infrastructure systems, his passion lies in exploring processes that foster social imagination for spatial design, in particular on the collaborative use of VR and AR platforms for new urban systems and public spaces design. Um, so without further ado, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Ricardo, and the floor is yours. You have more or less 30 minutes, and then we'll uh, have an opportunity for questions. If the people want to ask questions, they can uh, write in the chat, and the questions can be in English, Portuguese, Spanish, and that, I guess three languages is enough. Yeah, thank it, you. It should, be, it should be more than enough. Okay, uh, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, thank you, Fabio. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really an honor to be speaking with you all. Um, I'm going to try to go very fast because I have, a, I have quite a bit of material. Uh, so let, let, let's hope I'm able to deliver it in, in, in the 30 minute time frame. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is about, is about you know, uh, play VR, AI, and planning. Uh, you know, I work in the Sensible City Lab and, and we're within the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. And, you know, as, as we have seen in the, in the past century, right, primarily because of the modernist mentality of, of, of order and segmentation of activity and spatial segmentation, this, this logic of, of order, efficiency in distribution, efficiency in operation, efficiency in human activity, you know, it, it has been one of the main drivers of modern urbanism in the past, you know, in the past hundred years, almost hundred years. Uh, you know, you yourselves in Brazil, uh, you know, of course know this very well. And uh, what we do in the lab, primarily when it comes to really thinking about future urbanism and the role of digital technologies has to do with this. You know, it, it, it sort of sits square in the middle of, you know, what today gets referred to as smart cities. And, you know, Fabio, Fabio Duarte and myself, you know, you know, while working in the lab, we, we, we kept discussing about how we have this tendency to, 
you know, repeat the mistakes of the past, philosophically speaking. So in the same way in which modernism try to bring a, a, a certain sense of uh, regimented efficiency and distribution to cities. Uh, when we think about what is happening within the smart cities field, what we see is that there is a large cry, again, for the use of digital technologies for the sake of efficiency. And if you go into the industry, if you go and talk to cities, everything is efficiency, 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 be it on traffic or on pollution or on time or on energy, right? Um, you know, the, in a wide array of solutions, anywhere from smart lives to smart traffic management to, you know, of course, surveillance, depending on where you are, et cetera, et cetera. But it seemed to us that the philosophy, this philosophy of just being very one dimensional, in the sense in which we are thinking about the application of technologies across various problems that you know they they do merit uh, solutions, but cities have more dimensions. And we, we you know if if you look at this, you, you guys know this very well. We keep putting more and more sensors and more and more systems to make a city effectively operate better. Yet, when we wrote the book, we wrote the book Urban Play, our take was, wait a minute, there are other dimensions when it comes to city design and city development that are also very important. This has to do with pleasure. This has to do with discovery. This has to do with you know, building agreeable, building you know, spaces that people want to be in that resonate, that stays with people, because we human beings, we're not inherently efficient machines. So why do we keep downplaying, uh, oftentimes, the use of digital technologies in the narrative, in the discourse of smart cities, okay, and sort of forget all of these types of additional uses or combinations of th or synthesis of technology to you know, also create cities where people want to live with. I've, I've never seen anybody you know, wanting to live in a city simply because it has more manageable traffic. But people will go to places that are you know, historically beautiful, that are historically filled with messiness of human activity. So when we wrote this book, we, we, we began with this by framing two theses. Number one is that you know, technology is most powerful when it's playful. And this is important because oftentimes when we take a functionist approach, we sort of, it, it's a very, you know, engineer-centric mentality in which we have a problem and we sort of, you know, try to craft a solution around that problem and then we synthesize that technology specifically for that purpose. Um, but if you go into the history of technology, you can see that you know, there's, there's a step before where you have a technology trigger, a new technology being created. And if you allow yourself to the space and time to experiment and play with it, you end up creating far more variations of that technology, which over time, it spreads out uh, the tree of possibilities. So if we really think about it from that point of view, you know, what we really should be thinking about when it comes to you know, the digital cities of tomorrow is that we should actually go beyond efficiencies. And what we should aim for is to use technology to create emotionally resonant spaces. And, and this idea of emotional resonance, you know, it, it was of course inspired by, you know, by, for example, the work of the situation is, you know, Guy Debord and, and, and all these people in Paris where they would they would used to go and walk around Paris and, and draw maps. This is, uh, this is the guy, the, the Guy Psychogeographic uh, of Paris, where they would just walk around, try to get a feel of the city, try to understand their emotional state in the city. Uh, and this is a way of looking at a city from a very different lens than, than, than just you know, counting vehicles or counting people or counting you know, a particulate matter, et cetera, et cetera. This is trying to tell us more about you know, where, 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 where humans, I'm gonna say, 
hearts and desires are in a place. And you know, they these guys they were motivated by they would call the flaneur, and these are these people who just who would just you know wander about a city, absorbing the city with all of their senses, but at the same time, you know, sort of really developing an attachment to them. So if we go, you know, to to uh, to Henri Lefebvre's theory of space, where you know before we develop the space, we conceptualize it and we think about it, we imagine it, and then we go out and build it. And most of the time, we think that when we build the space, that's it. But but what Lefebvre teaches us is that there's actually a period afterwards where people, you know, they sort of contestate with each other to really come to terms about what that space is going to be produced. So when we're writing our book, we get thinking about how do we trigger those processes of social contestation, of social imagination, and how can we use digital technologies to help us through the process? And at the same time, how do we use digital technologies to also create mediated spaces that fall you know, beyond just urban efficiencies or spatial efficiencies? Um, and if we stick to this notion of play, to this notion of allowing yourselves to you know, be other characters, break the rules, break things, uh, you know, have a plastic social uh, uh, dynamic. What can those spaces feel like? So I'm going to give you some examples of this. For example, uh, you know, one project we saw was Bloom. Uh, Bloom is a project done by architect Elisa Andrasek. It was originally developed uh, for the, and launched at the uh, London Olympics. And the project, what you see here, it's basically a just a, a computer design um, structure of, of three joints that can be shaped and modeled, you know, in an infinite rate of possibilities. It's basically like Legos. And now beyond the, the piece themselves, what is interesting about Alisa's work is that the way they would approach the socializing aspect of co-creation. You would, you would walk into, and they would have this fantastic structure already set up. And, uh, you know, it's unusual in by itself. It's very telling because of the color, but then they would allow people to walk inside the structure. And most important, they would allow people to break it. They would allow people to start taking pieces and start breaking, figuring pieces, and then shaping those pieces on their own. And this project it generates this fantastic dynamic of people understanding that they are being allowed to transform their space, that it's okay. And that if you play, you go way out of the boundaries of what some people would pre-encode in the purpose of a, of a space that is being built. Uh, other works that we saw was, for example, you know, in Brazil, the Guto Requeña's Dancing Pavilion uh, this is interesting. This is a this is a completely dynamic building mediated through sensors and actuators to respond to the environment. You know, it, it was a temporary uh, it was a temporary piece for the Rio Olympics, and you know, some of you may know this project, but we find it fascinating. And here you can see right there all the assembly of the actuators, of the spinning, uh, all the different sensors, uh, you know, that could capture anywhere from sound and movement, light, and all the pre encoding of the different behaviors of the building in synchronicity with different types of human activity. And this created a dynamic number one showpiece for the city but also this living space where the randomness, the seeming randomness uh, or the surprising effect of the behavior of the building, you know, uh, people resonated with people who like it. Not only about the spectacle, it's about the surprise, about the playfulness, about allowing uh, that space to, you know, create different forms of serendipity in terms of activities. Another good example of this is a project, uh, the Digital Water Pavilion designed by Carlo Rari for the 
for the Zaragoza World Expo in 2009. And this was basically a building made out of water. And it created a very similar effect. It was, it was you know, a collection of sensors and actuators. The media was water, but it was also a building that was, that was playful uh, into itself. And actually, uh, you know, one of the best days of that, of the, of the Zaragoza World Fair was when the building broke down and it just started behaving randomly and it went crazy and people had a blast with it. It also tells us, it also looks at us in ways that if you think about exploring the uses of digital technology beyond direct sensors and actuators, then you can really start thinking about, you know, the, the material, the materiality of the buildings and what do you use with it. So for example, the Mediated Matter Group over at the Media Lab at MIT, they've been working a lot with this. And one of the projects that fascinated us was the SIL Pavilion. And this is a project where they were really thinking about how can we create buildings, number one, using organic materials, uh, but, you know, co-creating with nature. And how can you use, you know, digital technologies to, you know, achieve that process? So what they did was this pavilion made out of, made out of completely out of silk. But most important for me is how they did it. And the way that they did this was they, they hacked biology. They put, a, they put a neodymium magnet on the head of the silkworm alongside with some cameras. You see the magnet over there. And as the, as the silkworm kept moving, uh, building each cocoon, they placed some magnetometers on the side. Uh, and then they developed some machine learning tools to understand the varying patterns of movement, okay, that are triggered by touch, by the touch of the, the silkworm's legs, uh, which now that they understood the code of the patterns of movement, this then allowed them to write code physically through 3D printed matter, okay, that would effectively guide uh, a silkworm. So you're basically hacking the biology. And now once you do this study and you understand how you can modulate different forms and behaviors from silkworms, then, you know, they, then you can create a structure thinking about biofabrication. And what they did is they brought hundreds of silkworms. Uh, they 3D printed a structure on it, okay? Um, so now they use computer tools to effectively model Okay, all of those behaviors into, you know, the, the outcome structure that they decide to build. And then they build the threads, the base threads, and they 3D printed the grooves. And then you've got hundreds of silkworms, place them. And as the silkworms, they started weaving and weaving and weaving and weaving gradually a structure comes into being. And this is a way of just going, of really thinking, radically thinking about the use of digital technology, in this case alongside biology, to create a, just a different type of space. And this is the, this is the space. So, so how do we go about this? Uh, in our book, I'm not having enough time to talk about this here, but in our book, we, we go through different cases of how this has been achieved at, at not only architectural scale, but also at urban scale, how you can use playful technologies to really bring meaning, yeah, even to see these, uh, it made, you know, you, you, you made the argument in very successful cases of, uh, of places that people enjoy and like to be in. But when it comes about learning from play, we also look at other industries that are all about creating spaces, but they use playful technologies to create them and to engage with the users. And one industry that fascinated us is actually video games. And video games is interesting. They've been around for over 50 years. Uh, and what, you know, it began as very simple, uh, you know, pixels on screen, simple arrays of pixels on screen. It very rapidly, in just a few decades, it kept evolving and evolving to, you know, add not only greater visual complexity, but greater systemic complexity. 
to the point where you could start, you could begin to mimic the real world. This is a Japanese game called Ryuga Gotoku, and you can see uh, you can see a portion of Tokyo on the right side and the digital representation on the left side. This is there's a study on favelas morphology just for a game called called Max Payne, which has been of course molded and altered uh, as a gameplay level, but keeping the structure. Uh, this, this is GTA Five, which is a game that you know it has a a, a very deep systemic layer of activities pre-encoded in space that you can just trigger them dynamically as you go on along the day. But what these games use, we found it more interesting because the industry is an industry that has evolved over time from computer science, you know, very early in the 70s and 80s. And as it gained more uh, progress, as it gained uh, more complexity in terms of the visual representation and even more important on the design objectives uh, in terms of gameplay, uh, there was a kind of a takeover in the industry about the tools that it needed that it needed to create those types of experiences. And the tools are very robust now. Uh, they allow us, you know, you, you get into a game engine like Unity or Unreal or Crime Engine, and they allow us to really do large scale simulations to really integrate a lot of different data streams, not just to model spaces and model behaviors and represent spaces, uh, but to create variations of how you encode activity in space. And this has happened in parallel with an industry that more and more is bringing in users into the mix, not when a game is finished, but actually very early on in the game development. So it's an industry that has learned to, number one, test a lot, uh, but it's also an industry that has learned to ask a lot to the users, what do they want to do in this space? And these two is an important reflection because if we think about it, in, you know, in the urban planning field and in the architectural field, most of the times what we build are prototypes. Thinking about as Lefebvre, we, we imagine those spaces and we go out and build them, uh, but our processes and how do we ask people what they want, what they need? What are the tools that, that, that we use okay, to extract that information so that they can inform our design are extremely limited in the field. Yet this is an industry that has figured out some of those puzzles and they are creating incredibly complex, incredibly rich spaces. This is of course happening at the same time where we now have new tools for simulation, representation, and immersion. Uh, and if we think about it, right, think about what, what you know, um, a single point perspective did for the field of art and architecture. It would have been massively important. It's a way of representing three-dimensional space over uh, two-dimensional flat surfaces. But now, as the as the dream of immersive media, precisely through tools of VR and AR, and more and more important uh, through artificial intelligence, uh, helping us coalesce everything. Uh, you know, we're rapidly moving from this uh, kitschy view of VR in the 90s that was quite frankly ridiculous, to, you know, objects that are, you know, being increasingly shrunk and increasingly more powerful and they are working the way we uh, look at spatialized media, virtually spatialized media or contextual media through AR. And the media changes the process. This is a, there's an artist called Glenn Keane and he's the original, one of the original animators from Disney and he's been trying what is known as sculptural drawing through VR. And now we can immerse a lot of the data that we have we even already have encoded in 3D environments. Think about, think about Google Street View, think about Google Earth, and how now you can experience that through virtual reality. So some of the classes that we conduct in the lab, sometimes we do our site survey using VR over Google Earth. And it's a completely different dynamic than consuming that through a two-dimensional uh, two surface, even if it's the same data, even if it's the same media. So increasingly what we're seeing is a blend of uh, tool simulation and tool building 
uh, tools for uh, city building. Uh, and oftentimes some of these simulations used uh, in highly complex games like the Cities Excel for planning purposes, but now being done through dynamics of co-creation and at the same time through immersive tools, right? Try to synthesize morphology, try to learn from the tracking of humans to understand the patterns of use, okay? Or simply just giving them the tools to emulate. This is a, this is a downtown Chicago done in Minecraft by a group of people that just came together and started doing it. Uh, and all the tools now moving from the screen to virtual reality uh, while having simultaneous groups of people uh, jointly having shared experiences within the same space. So we wanted to do a little bit of a test on one of that, and one of the robots, which I'm sure that Fabio will speak a lot more uh, later uh, when, when, when he comes to speak with you guys. But one of the projects that we're working on is robot, which is a fleet of autonomous boats. Uh, but at the beginning, you know, there was this open question of what are we going to use this for? So we actually used VR to have a conversation with people in Amsterdam. Okay, what would you use it for? You know, using other tools as well, but helping them, you know, through the headset, understand matters of scale, but also to digitally play in a safe environment, combinations and recombinations of uses. So there you see, you see the people just testing in VR and, and you know, we gave them tools so that they could, um, they could just propose, right? Learning some tool sets. And these are workshops, and, you know, we did this in about three days. And by the end of, a, you know, day two, day three, you would see the, you would see the, you know, the users basically, you know, playing with the, you know, planes and, and using that in rich media to share to the audience some of, you know, some of their ideas. And this is a much richer experience than the traditional kind of discussion that we, that, that we have as planners. And, you know, now, you know, the rowboats, uh, you know, they, a few weeks ago, the first physical rowboats just went live in Amsterdam. We were very happy about that. But this was about exploring uses beyond the normal, just move people or just move goods. What are the things that you can do, such as, you know, trash collection, for example. On a platform that if you think about it, it's not just about uh, moving things from point A to point B, but they're also information platforms in their own right. You know, as they move about the city with their sensors, they're scanning the environment, and then we're able to use, uh, you know, various forms of artificial intelligence, not only to classify the different elements, in this case, through computer vision, or to use the information from the lighter sensors uh, to, you know, do a three-dimensional mapping of the city. And when we do a sensor fusion of all of the, of all of the different uh, elements being captured through the point cloud and through the video feed, then this is an incredibly powerful information platform for the city. So what I'm really talking about is, 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 is this cycle of science and design. And what we're really writing about in the book is how very, very often in the smart cities field, the science aspect of it, okay, and the functional aspect of it has completely overtaken a lot of the discussions around the possibilities of design. So for us, Robot is a project where we're able to blend the full, the full cycle, if you want. A full cycle where we're able to use these tools to co-create with people in a playful environment, to come up with possibilities in a language that is, that is closer, not only in terms of intent, but in terms of what can be actionable to the developers. But then the developers, of course, applying a lot of different techniques, methods, and technologies to build the object. And that object creates feedback loops of information which can be represented through rich media to then improve the design in a continuous loop so that you never end it. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. I guess you, you are you are very fast. You said you had a lot of material, but you did cover everything. 
So, I know, I, I try to move very fast. I might have skipped a thing or two. Okay. So now we have time for a few questions. Um, let we we'll start with a question from Professor Luis Bintencourt from Campinas, Unicamp. Uh, can you take yes, your question? Let, yeah, let, let me stop my sharing so that... There we go. Hi. Hi, Ricardo. Thank you for the, the, the inspiring talk. Um, so how far do you think we are from like uh, buying and downloading our homes from the internet? Like I, download, I buy a home, download a file with the design of my home and then my house. Um, and then I just have a printer to print this house at my, my land. And then um, then I just have to buy this, this, this file on the internet. And um, which material do you think it's likely to be used to print houses besides uh, concrete? So actually you, you, you ask a, that's an interesting question. Let me try to unpack it. From a technology point of view, that's doable today. Okay, uh, there has been for many years now, actually, uh, you know, projects that have used three D printers of various scales and different materials, not only concrete, uh, but you know, concrete, uh, hardened plastics, high density polymers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, even even glass. Okay. To, to print large scale structures, including buildings and houses. Okay, uh, so, so that, you know, it already exists. There, there's, there's a really nice project that I like here in Mexico that was, that was done in the state of Oaxaca, where they, they're basically building, they're 3D printing affordable housing. And they're able to basically print a house a day. Okay, so it's really, really fast. To me, what is more interesting than, 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 than that capability of doing the material side of it is actually how do you allow people to create those buildings on their own terms? And that's a more challenging question. And I, if you think about it, we actually have a lot to learn, for example, from informal structures. Think about informal settlements where people, they go about and they kind of build their, their, you know, the, 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 their own homes piece by piece, room by room over time. You, you have this, you have this shapes of, you know, not only favelas in Brazil, but I'm thinking about the barrios in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. That's a little bit of a more organic um, typology that just happens over time. So what would happen if you start giving people pre-encoded tools of spatial distribution and creation so that they can they can come and and for that you know machine learning tools and ai tools are going to be a very important piece of the puzzle because basically what they're going to do is they're going to reduce the complexity when you when you walk into a planner's meeting the, the first thing that i often see it's it's an enormous uh it's, 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 it's an enormous asymmetry in regards to the powers of the planners and the experts and the domain experts and the users. And those are compounded by gaps in terms of the communication tools or the interaction tools that they have. So what this really is about is what do you do when you use tools such as AI to simplify complexity? And then you use immersive tools that are very easy to play with so that people can feel, can, can understand, okay, that they can achieve something actually quite sophisticated, but now on their own terms, that you can then integrate to a physical building capacity of something like a 3D printer. That to me is the revolution if we think about the whole pipeline. So on the construction side, I think we're making pretty good progress. I think the race right now is precisely to shy away from concrete uh, because of uh, primarily environmental issues. Uh, I think that the tools are going to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, okay? So that over time will become a kind of a new norm. Uh, even though I do think that we're still pretty far off from building the combinations of tools that we need uh, across environments. We're not there yet. Right. When it comes to the to the intelligent uh, modeling and design and co-design, 
uh, I think you know, one of the one of the points that we bring out in the book is precisely that the planning and architectural fields should be a little bit more humble and learn from fields such as video games. You know, the video games industry actually studied a lot architecture and planning to learn how to create their virtual worlds. And in a certain extent, for some of the processes, the truth is that they have better tools, far better tools, not even close. Okay. Uh, so when we wrote this book, one of the things we were telling, you know, some of the planners in the department, it was like, hey, you know, you might want to look at that because these guys have built some pretty cool stuff that you can, if we're able to integrate that within the pipeline, I actually think it's, which I think it's really, really doable. In fact, I personally think it's, it's almost inevitable. Okay. Um, I think that it's just a matter of having some early movers starting to test this within the field and just integrate the pipeline and boom, like that. You're going to trigger it very fast. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks. We, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but first, uh, Professor Rafael Carmargo will ask a question in, using your voice, Rafael. Yeah, voice in video. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. So thanks for the great talk. Um, when showing these slides on the VR and the 3D environment, the first thing that comes to my mind is the, the metaverse. Yeah? Maybe where people will be able to navigate on different places and yeah. they, they will be able maybe to choose a, a go into some predefined environment where you have all the actual architecture already, already built like in GTA, or they, you can go to a completely raw environment where people can build everything from scratch, including the buildings and everything. Uh, do you think this can be a good way to, to learn how people interact with it, the environment and how they prefer to shape these environments? Uh, yes, but you don't need to wait for the metaverse. Uh, let, let me let me be more clear. The metaverse is not a new idea. It's actually a very old idea, like really, really old. Okay, uh, if you go into the history of, first of all, if you go into the history of VR, okay, we've been trying to hack immersive media for 150 years. Some of the pictures of what I showed, like I showed, uh, uh, you know, Sutherland sort of Damocles. That's from 1964. In literature, people like William Gibson. Uh, or, or people like Neil Stevenson, they wrote about the metaverse in the 80s and in the early 90s. It's, it's not a new idea. Simply what happens is that we're hearing a lot of noise right now because now it seems like it is achievable. For a long time, uh, virtual reality was, was, was hype, was pure hype. I've been using VR headsets for 25 years. And what has changed in the past nine years is that a group of people, uh, particularly one guy named Palmer Lucky, they were able to crack a critical piece of the puzzle in terms of, uh, if you think about it in terms of computer science, in terms of the shader, the rendering shaders in the pipeline, okay, uh, and the optics. So that you were able to make it smaller, more affordable, and cheaper, computationally speaking. VR industry today is an industry that is built on the back of the smartphone industry, the semiconductor industry, and the gaming industry. Now, what's interesting is that if you go into the gaming industry, the gaming industry has been doing metaverses since the 90s. Like, uh, you know, Peter Garriott did Ultima Online in 1998. World of Warcraft has been alive for over 20 years. Uh, if you go to something like EVE Online, which has millions of players building complex economies and interacting with them, and what is really interesting about these systems is that they are social systems. People actually build their own types of rules of what is uh, acceptable or not. And they have layers of mediation in between the players. They're very complex. It's funny, in the, in the academic literature, I read a lot about uh, uh, Second Life, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of that. Uh, but if you look into the gaming world, Second Life was actually kind of shitty. It was not very good. There are far better examples. It's just that if you go to something like World of Warcraft or Eve or, you know, take, take, or like Destiny or take your pick, uh, because they are situated 
on a sci-fi environment or in a fantasy environment, oftentimes people don't pay attention to them. They say like, oh, they're games. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Forget about how it looks. Understand what they're doing at the systemic level and at the social mediation level. If you ever see a session of co-creation of Minecraft, it is mind-blowing. You can effectively code Minecraft. People think about it as just Lego block. No, no, no. I've seen teams of people coordinate and, 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 and reprogram a space. It's really cool. And if I see what is, for example, this, this, this city building, this city creating game that I showed you an image, Cities Excel, uh, that thing is coming in VR in about three months. That's what I'm talking about. So when you have these tools that approximate the medium, then it's important. Uh, I think that when it comes to the metaverse, we have to be a bit wary as well. Uh, you know, uh, for the metaverse to succeed, it means that there's a lot of people spending a lot of time in it. And I'm not sure that's a good outcome for cities. There's a little bit of a sad thing surrounding it, right? about people just wanting to be in the virtual world more, in the, more than in the real world, okay? So, uh, but, but there's a lot of that already. Some of the visions that, you know, you saw Mark Zuckerberg a month ago, you know, pushing the vision of the metaverse, and he's not the only one. Google's doing his work. Vario is doing its own work. Uh, Niantic is doing its own work. And NVIDIA is doing its own work of the metaverse. We know it's coming, and the reason why it's coming is because from a human machine interface, immersive media is far more, like far, far more powerful than two dimensional media, like way beyond. So what you're seeing right now is a lot of noise because these are big technology companies that they don't want to miss out on what they now perceive as an achievable next generation human machine interface. That's what it's really about. It's about controlling the information ecosystems of that at the hardware and platform level. Now it comes to us to really, number one, pay a lot of attention about the rules of the game being imposed at a platform level. That's very important. Number two, okay, really start doing this kind of Lefebvrean movement of, of, of social contestation to come into terms of what are we, what are those going to spaces be like? I don't want those spaces to be dictated by Facebook, okay? But I might ask for Facebook to give me a free range of tools so that I create those spaces. That's the type of conversation we should be having around the metaverse. But the mediation tools, many of them, they already exist. And there's, and, 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 and companies are learning a lot. And the video gaming industry, methodologically speaking, they have learned a lot on how to mine this. Okay, so we have several more questions, but we have time for one last question. And so I'm choosing one. <laughs> and in the context that you talked about using this play, uh, in the context of designing new technologies and how to deploy new technologies in the, in the real world, of Professor Alfredo Godeman asks, how to avoid the traps from the internet? like in today's internet in which regular people use very few sites and the same happens with social networks where people usually stays in a bubble in limited subjects how to really improve this experience when you're doing the, the, this design in a playful manner how to avoid that's a very, that's a, actually that's a really really cool question that's a really cool question it's a really interesting question because what you're talking about is as you're socializing these types of creations, right? The technology themselves become, I'm gonna say, algorithmic curators. And because you're an algorithmic curator, you risk on creating echo chambers of design. I, I think you're right. I think that's a real risk. Uh, there, it, it, I, think, I think it goes at different levels. Number one has to do with the language of design Okay, either how do you norm it from being too chaotic to how do you norm it from being unimaginative? Simply because people uh, don't know how to play with that. Uh, 
you know, the, 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 uh, there's a case that comes to mind and it's actually the housing, the housing design regulations in Belgium, okay? Uh, that are quite free range and people have a lot of fun designing their house. And, you know, yeah. some people hate it and say that it's absolutely messy and crazy. Some people actually say it's unique. It's uniquely Belgian, okay? So when you, when you look into some of the creation that happened in the virtual spaces, uh, the truth is that it's, 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 it's a lot like that, okay? You give free reign to people and people just go and build crazy stuff, like really, really crazy stuff. But from time to time, some things really cool happen and everybody coalesces into them. And that kind of changes the, the perception of what is possible, what is doable. One of the things that designers do for that, uh, in, in gaming it happens a lot, is they do... They, they see themselves as almost design Sherpas. So you release a tool set and they release game, game experiences or level experiences that are fully designed. And then they tell the people, I did this with the tool set that I'm giving you. So I'm giving you the instructions on how to use the tool set and I'm showing you the possibilities of what is it that you can do. Uh, and, and, and you see these communities coming that to effect that effectively mod games. And very often after a little while, you see the communities themselves producing things of greater sophistication than the original design by the, I'm gonna say professional designers. This is very common, really, really common. And in fact, it works so well that the gaming industry uses it as a way to recruit talent because there's a, there's a shortage of talent. So, so, you know, a very useful, you know, pool of people to tap, to hire, are modders. Oh, you guys did some amazing levels. Oh, you guys did, you guys did this amazing experience. Why didn't you come work for me? So that cycle, it's funny because it does create an echo chamber when something is very successful. But the cultural value within the community it's more about experiment, 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 experiment. So that value of content experimentation sort of supersedes the inertia from the echo chamber. And I think that's a value that we should learn from. I don't, so the real question then is how do you put these sorts of tools forward, but make experimentation, social experimentation the preponderant value within the scale of the value system so that every time there's an echo chamber around something that everybody's talking about the same, okay, uh, the inertia doesn't become to circulate around that single topic. The, the natural inertia becomes like, okay, this is cool. What's next? Let us continue to experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. I really like yeah. your answer because we're very optimistic. Thank you very much. No, no, my pleasure. I, I think it's a fantastic question, by the way. I haven't thought about it. So I'm like, oh my God, oh, this is good. Uh, and, and, and if you guys have any other questions, I mean, feel free to send me an email. Uh, you know, I'll be happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much. There are three or four more questions, but we don't have more time. So I guess you need to invite Ricardo to come to Brazil next year, hopefully after the pandemic. And then... Oh yes, I would love that because I have, <laughs> I have fun in Brazil a lot every time I go. Okay, so we'll, we'll receive an invitation. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you.